Okay, a um, couple quick questions for the audience. Because uh, I wrote, this is my fifth attempt at this talk. Uh, because I wasn't sure exactly what the audience was. Are we mostly research assistants or researchers or sysadmins? Raise your hands. Okay, I wrote the wrong talk. Uh, <laughs> I was expecting a lot more uh, researchers, so this is going to be a, the, the slides are very high level. Just stop me when you want me to answer the real questions that you got on you. Um, this is, uh, my name is Steven Smugin. I work for Red Hat. Come on. Am I too far away? I'm too far away. Damn. Nope, this is not going to work. Yes, sir? Can you clarify what you mean by software infrastructure sanitation engineer? Well, you know, there's all these people that call themselves SREs these days. Uh, they're uh, reliability ex engineers. Um, most of infrastructure is not much better than a bunch of pipes put in the ground, buried and forgotten, and um, then dug up when they break. Uh, as any real sysadmin knows, um, that you're dealing with something from 20 years ago plus five years ago, and somebody's duct taped in something really new that hasn't even been released yet. Uh, so I call myself an in, I usually call myself a, a sanitation engineer, but I added in the infrastructure to clarify so that you understand that I work on infrastructure software wise, not hardware wise. Although actually all my work is on com hardware computers. Okay, this is not going. I was hoping I could stand and do the other thing that people had done. Oh, yeah, well, I don't have a have clicker. One you can borrow. All right, uh, this is what we're going to go over. Again, I have done talks at various places, so the first thing we normally have to do, yeah, just. There you go. All right. All right. This is our going to be our agenda. I will try and make this fast and quick because the smell of food coming upstairs is. But as I said, I'm ex I wasn't sure exactly who, what our general things are. If there are questions you have, bring it up. If you say you already know this and you want me to move on to the next slide, we will do so. OK. I worked at a government lab. And so therefore, I understand that every talk was supposed to start with, please understand how to escape this room know the way to leave the room, and if the fire escape goes off, uh, please leave, do not run, and escape properly. If you see anything glowing while you're doing so, do not pick up, do not touch, do not lick. And I say that because I worked with graduate research assistants in uh, uh, my... So, who is your presenter today? I want to thank everybody at uh, Oak Ridge for allowing a Los Alamos National Lab uh, former employee to come over. Years ago, I would not have been allowed into the gate. Um, and the same goes the other way. Um, very tribal. It's almost like a Clemson UT thing. Uh, I worked for Lanel twice, once as a graduate research assistant. Um, and once as a, both, I worked on the Q machine as a contractor and uh, then moved into computer security because I was tired of finding things that I didn't like. Uh, I left Los Alamos right before they changed over and worked for SNL for a very short time, but it didn't stick. Uh, I've worked for Red Hat since 2009, and I also worked for Red Hat from 97 to 2001, so I'm coming up to 15 years off and on on the company. Um, okay, 
sorry, I forgot about, I spread it out across a couple of things. This is, you know, when you're a graduate research assistant or assistant, I mean, this is how you see yourself. You know, the lone guy out there solving all the problems, fixing things. My focus currently is on CentOS and uh, Apple, which is extra packages for enterprise Linux. I mostly deal with getting those packages in as best I can into a workable order. I worked with CentOS since the founding days, 15 years ago. Uh, shortly afterwards, I didn't know the first group of people, but I did know the second group. I worked, helped on QA for Red, RHEL 5, or CentOS 5. I had to leave because I became a Fedora pro employee in 2009, the day they were going to ask me to join the board. Um, okay, why am I here? My first project uh, was working as a digitized astronomy project at a university for a uh, professor, uh, Dr. Sterling Colgate, who did a whole bunch of supernova research back in the day. Um, the computer we were working on was a Prime 300. It um, wouldn't have even fitted on the bottom of the, that, those graphs earlier about how many MIPS you have. It, it was this tall, this wide, and had 640K in it. Um, I transferred, most of the data was written in Fortran 4, and the Prime was from worked till 94. Same code. The code actually had been written on an S390, 360 originally, and uh, from and had been ported over. After I left uh, college, I went and worked for uh, Lanel as a graduate research assistant. I worked on a project called Alexis, which basically was a satellite that flew and looked for X-ray emissions from places, uh, mostly from the sky, but. We also looked at the ground every now and then. Uh, its software for it ran for 20 years. And the way I know that is, as a graduate research assistant, I was, this is how my bosses looked at me. Uh, my job originally was to compile and update code. So, and I was told, Your co the code is too slow, make it go faster. So I went and looked, and I found all these options I could put into my compilations, and I did a great graduate research assistant. Turns out pi should not be a 16-bit number when you're doing 32-bit and 64-bit calculations. Um, things moved much faster. Uh, we had to redo months' worth of data when they found that out. They also have found out that some of the other storage that had been done had been overwritten because uh, I'd gone to a new option. I'd, I did exactly what every graduate research assistant does. He sees that you're running really old code. You're told to update it. What are you first thing you do? You find the latest code out there on the network. You put it in there. Latest code didn't have all the ABIs, and so the database that they were using didn't store all the data in the new database stored half the data, the bottom end of the data. So I had the top 16 bits of pi, I had the bottom 16 bits of the, uh, uh, or 32 bits, because it was 64-bit storage in the database. I was not looked on really nicely as a graduate research assistant. My first half of the year was compiling all the code, making it work on eight different Unixes. Second half of the year was fixing all the code so that it worked with the old code. I'm saying this because if you're a researcher, you have graduate research assistants or postdocs coming in who are doing what they think they're supposed to be doing, just like I did. And the guy who came in five years later and asked me why I had done what I'd done, why, why there was this whole spend of time of me rewriting all this stuff to go back to what it was old because, well, I'd broken everything, and he was gonna rewrite it to the newest stuff. And I said, no, um, don't. Don't touch it, because you will, you, what, what was happening was, and of course, he didn't listen to me, so he did it, and then the satellite turned out to be, you know, all your code says this, satellite's spinning. So you have to have 
you know, pi, but you also have to have e to a certain amount, and you have to have some other things because it's a not a it's an elliptical orbit and some of the stuff. Satellite was being missed by 0.1 second every day. There was a every pass over the lab as it was be, the data was being downloaded it was getting a little further out, and a little further out, a little further out, and then by three months later. He, he sent me an email saying, well, I shouldn't have updated the code because I missed the satellite today. And my boss, Diane, has told me that you've done a smoogin. <laughs> okay, software these days. Everyone has a modern stack. Um, how many of you guys do, wh what's your favorite stacks for if you're doing research or writing? Pardon? Yes, okay. Stack Overflow is, of course, the, the best stack. Uh, I, should, I walked into that. I, I should have realized that one. Um, we live in a great time compared to even 10 years ago. We have Stack Overflow. I mean, honestly, if I'd had Stack Overflow, most of the problems I, ran, I reinvented um, were, um, would not have happened because somebody had already answered it. <sighs> Code is much better than it used to be. It used to be that if you, uh, one of my jobs was dealing with five different Javas all running data analysis at SNL. I had 1.2, 1.4, 1.5, SNL 1.5. If, if you've ever worked with anything from Sandia National Labs, you might have worked on one of their chips, which is an embedded Java environment. It's a true 1.5 running in hardware is Java. It, it was really great, but it's not really 1.5. It's a subset of it to make sure everything works. And, um, we all had to get all that working together. So you had to have each in a separate stack, all running around, trying to talk to each other, and everything would walk over each other. You'd end up with an update from Oracle, because by that point it was getting to be Sun Oracle, um, removing half the stuff and you having to go to backups and try to figure out all the configuration files. But like I said, we've got great things. They inv Virtual environments are good. However, you will find out that while you have all these stacks, you will have multiple stacks that require different things. Very few of the sandboxes, the virtual environments, work with each other. They, they'll, you, know, you can get a Python environment to work with a Python environment to work with a Python environment to work with a Python environment, but it may not work with something else except in with a certain subset of things, but not the code that you wanted because it needs it to work in a different set. And I'm sure some of you guys have to deal with this somewhere. Storage is not cheap, no matter what they say. You can, they, somebody will tell you, some postdoc will tell you, well, I just bought a, a five terabyte disk. I don't know why you can't bring it online. And your storage person is just beating his head against the wall somewhere because you can't put a five terabyte IDE drive into a SAN array or a, most of my knowledge of, of the arrays are 20 years out of date for what's in computer, uh, supercomputers these days. But um, even if you attach it to a Gluster thing, it's going to be, there's a whole bunch of things you have to do. You can't just stick a disk in there. And you don't get all the throughput that you expect when you are trying to do a large amount of data. And finally, the ugly of data. So much of your st software stacks expect you to be on the internet, which when I wrote this, I wasn't, I was thinking, I wasn't cognizant of the separation between Y12 and Ornl, uh, or Oak Ridge, O-R-N-L, is how you guys say it. I, I, we always, we, you know, um, we called it snail, Ornl, Lanel, little old no. But um, 
I guess that you guys have a bit more network access than I'm used to in a network national lab. Um, even the unclassified stuff was air-gapped physically at the supercomputers, except for when we would do the cross-country super mounting. You know, when you're trying to send, oh, we're going to show that we can throw a terabyte of data across the country, again, 20 years ago. Uh, the problem is, of course, is you, you've got, your postdoc has written this, written this great thing in Node.js, and it requires you to be on the internet to actually even run because it's actually pulling something live through a pseudo bash curl. Sorry, pseudo curl bash. Um, and you have to explain you can't do that. Or you have to explain, okay, we'll figure out some way. <laughs> um, the ugly other part is, is that because your projects, some of your projects, the ones I dealt with, were weapons um, checks. And so the data is from the 80s and 90s. The data has most of the code running it is written in Fortran 4, um, maybe up to 77 by some graduate student or other person. Uh, in, the, in the 2000s, and now maybe moving up to Fortran 90 because, well, uh, I've heard it's object-oriented. Uh, although now I think they're probably going to Fortran 2009 with functional. Um, but you need, you find out you're gonna, your code is going to be stuck with a whole bunch of things that are written before you were born. And you also have things that you don't, that are absolutely positively new. And it doesn't, you, some of the things you have to do to get that to work are very ugly. Okay, the next section of this goes into, I like the picture, sorry. Uh, these days, um, it was sort of brought up to mind, supercomputers are a lot of functional computing. And because you have these old stacks that you're going to have to work with, and the first thing your graduate student is going to do is say, okay, I saw that there's a security problem with this. I, I read, GitHub told me that your co the code I uploaded has a security problem, so I'm gonna up grade to upload to the uh, latest library. But only, I'll be smart and I'll run it on the old branch. I won't go to the very latest because I know it's got a completely different ABI and I don't want to actually program all that. I just want to, I'll get the latest security patch on that branch. 20 years ago, as I said, well, all we had to deal with was somebody uploading a CPAN thing that would, up, would spit out human anatomy pictures at the wrong moment. And everyone would get their ha, 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 ha type things and you, nothing, they wouldn't actually touch the code or anything. Now, although 20 years ago, I, I don't know if any of you guys ever worked with a, a security incident cult with Staccato. Uh, he had a thing where he would go through and break into supercomputers. And if he didn't get into the supercomputer and he didn't like you, he would delete all your data, which That was sort of the thing where things were changing from being, oh, it's a fun, fun, ha, ha, to, okay, now there's actual things for getting into open computers. What's happening and was in the news last week, and we were, I had to rewrite some of this stuff, was that the new thing for people is to go into these old branches and put a rootkit in there. Uh, because you're gonna up, your, your student's gonna come in. Maybe he's working on something else. Maybe it's an IoT thing or something like that. It's, um, but he, he update, uh, updates the GitHub, and boom, uh, stuck in that last security update for your CPAN or your Ruby or your GitHub, or sorry, Go, Golang is now a little thing that 
downloads from the internet or opens up the, a port so that you can um, you know, rootkit your uh, supercomputer from elsewhere, or at least you know, may start mailing off data. So as I said, I, I was expecting this to be more for research researchers who are dealing with things. So I, I put in that you know, you should, there needs to be a bit more time put in to teach your students who are coming in because I checked with my old friends at LANL and they still do the same thing. They throw a graduate research assistant in and say, hey, have fun, show, learn some new things and update this stuff and we'll get back to you at the end of the semester and ask you a, uh, if you had fun. You know, if, show some. So something, and I'll check on you weekly on my stuff, but otherwise, I'm not going to teach you not to do whatever Stack Overflow says, which is update to the latest release. Okay, this is another good and the bad and the ugly. I went through, as I was doing this talk, and I had a more detailed thing of how to mirror everything, um, of what, what, what's easy to mirror for your software, what is more bad. Perl, is wonderful. It is the easiest thing I've ever had to deal with in the last, of all these things to deal with. And I, I felt bad about putting it so high, but they've, they've worked on so many of the side problems because they've had so many years to do it, all this stuff. Um, it's back, super backwards compatible. It stores most of the things. You can get most of the stuff. And most of the other software packaging from either CPAN to RPMs just build out perfectly, and you can install it. And R seemed very close to it. Uh, they use, act I mean, it's CRAN versus CPAN. So, you know, you're already seeing where they've, they've built their, they've decided to do their stuff for version control. I started on Python 3 to figure out how to mirror it, uh, to mirror my own version of it, and go through how to set up own, like, construction of it. And I've forgotten how large your data sets are for machine learning. Uh, I ran out of disk space out of, on my eight, disk, eight terabyte disk. Um, I needed about 20 to get all the, the stuff in. Um, but a lot of it is several libraries that are just full of machine learning data sets. You don't need them, but if you try to mirror everything, because you thought it would be a good idea, uh, make sure you plan for it. Golang and Rust are very tied to the GitHub world, and it's very hard to build an archive of them. There are tools to do it, but most of them will just seem to pull stuff out of Golang, you know, oh, I'll just take a branch. It's Git. And I started on Node.js, and this is not a thing about the language. If people love Node.js, that's fine. It does its thing. It is a There's a lot of words I can't use uh, on trying to mirror it. It made Golang and Rust look easy. It, it, there's just so many things that are assuming that you are always on the internet, that you're always available, and all it takes, as you, everyone saw, was with somebody decides they're going to unpublish something on GitHub, and half your stack is gone because you had a one-line library. I mean. One line libraries. I, I just don't get it. But anyway, take down everything. And I say this because our, our website went down because somebody had a Node.js node and we, on the day that LeftPad went, so did we. There are commercial software solutions if you're having to deal with this. And I say this because I, mainly because there are open source ones, but again, I thought this was going to be more for researchers who might have a budget and want to deal with setting up something and not having anybody. There's a lot of fun in setting up your open source mirroring systems, and it's a good learning exercise, but that's not what you usually want to teach your students anymore. You want them to work on the deep AI problem that you've got. Um, both of these for if you're dealing with Node.js, I recommend getting an enterprise software thing. It deals with the branches, it stores it locally, and if no left pad disappears, you don't lose it. 
Um, same thing, Anaconda is a, it's more open source. They have an open source solution. But I recommend that if you implement Anaconda to deal with your Python and uh, to get the commercial because it, 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 if you got the money, spend it on it because uh, you'll, get, you'll get the support, but it'll keep them from going out of business because everybody assumed that the Anaconda would be free forever. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. I have to remember my, where the mic is. Um, now we're going to move into RPM. RPM is what I use for most of my stuff. It's old, like me. Uh, it allows a lot of customization. You, it has a couple things that other solutions start. One of the things I, I noticed with PyPy and uh, other tools is they start off being very simple. I solve my problem. I just download the software. I put it in an environment. I keep it. That's all I do. Don't need to worry about it after that because you're going to reload it and you re just grab the newest thing anyway. Except for research where you are going to be wanting to keep an artifact of everything together. And then you're going to have somebody come by five years from now and say, OK, I need you to repeat that experiment because your paper has been put on, you know, is coming up for an award. And you're like, oh, what experiment and what did I, where did I put that data? Uh, and how do I know it's not changed? So you have um, one of the two things I really enjoy about RPM over, and the other tools have them now, but they didn't have them as well when I was originally putting this together years ago. You can use it to prove trust because you can chain trust environments. You can say, I signed these packages with my key. I know I built these packages or I went through them and said, and you know that nobody's tampered with the package because it's all the way across. Uh, you can do internal integrity checks of each package. The V command is what it is, but VA will go through your entire system. I say this because both of those were very useful when I was dealing with the staccato stuff because we could see where our systems had been. We couldn't tell very easily on the uh, SGI boxes because they had no integrity. Yeah, I'm showing my age there. Uh, <laughs> um, what had been altered, and he'd altered some stuff, and we had to reload everything from scratch. But we were able to show and see through what files he had changed and what files he hadn't changed pretty easily and trust that he had not changed those files because the keys were uh, stored. You, there are multiple method. One of the things, other things I like about RPMs is a lot of people have solved the same problem, but the reason, which sounds bad because you end up with like, well, which one do I choose? But if you know, once you start looking at it, you know which one you're going to choose because you'll have a solution that fits your environment better. Um, there are five methods that I've used. Uh, you can set up your own OpenSUSE build system, which will allow you to build everything for a lot of other architectures system. So if you've got Debian boxes and you've got um, the, that build system will actually build artifacts for all the different things you want. If you're just dealing with uh, in your own local area, a mock chain, which comes with CentOS, Fedora, and even I think um, uh, SUSE, will just chain build all the packages in a loop until it's built or it spits out and says it's not done. I, I just recently used it to try to jumpstart the Apple 8 stuff, and it turned out to be really well. Uh, CentOS uses a program called Rhymesel, which is a smarter plague, which was an older system. And Fedora has uh, Koji and Coper. Both of those can be set up for your own build environments. Coper is just one part of the system. It, there's a, Coper does the builds. There's another system which does your QA, and there's another system which does your signing. And you, you loop them together in another project that I didn't put up here because I had forgotten uh, if he'd released it or not, called MBOX, which will basically modular build everything in a chain so you, you can have a complete thing. The big thing is that once you get a signing going on, 
you can do um, the next thing, which is taking packages. Say you, you're worried about somebody just downloading a bunch of packages and installing it on your box. Well, they're sent as signed, but you didn't want to get those ones because you've, you've worked on this kernel, you've worked on this glibc, you've got your artifact that you, you've signed off, that this is what your GPS, because the other thing I worked on was uh, GPS stuff, which is still running these days. And I, when I say I worked on it, I was, this, like I said earlier, I was a sanitation engineer. I basically set up the systems, I ran it, and then I wrote the, compiled the software that they wanted me to compile and made sure it stayed stuck after they told me not to upgrade it ever again. Um, you can sign the packages with your GPG key for your project and then s install that on the operating system and then your packages will not, when you try, somebody comes in and goes, oh, I just found this package, I'll install it. Yum will say, or it'll say, it's not signed, I'm not installing it. You can force it and all that, but at that point you're, you know, it's, when you do an audit check, you can find out that somebody did it and you can ask them why. Uh, deploying it that way means that, say, like with Apple, one of the big problems is somebody will do a big package push and you're not ready for it. Say, your project's in Python 3.4 and we upgraded to Python 3.6 and you have a daily cron job that says yum-y update. If you sign, use the Apple packages, your keys, you're going to get 3.6, whether you wanted to or not. If you download and mirror and sign, you'll get, you won't get them because you haven't signed those packages, you haven't approved them. Again, I originally wrote, wrote this as a, um, something towards RPM and, and deep down guts, but uh, I kind of got the idea, again, that we were gonna have a lot more research assistance, so I was trying to be a bit more high level what is more important than RPM itself is the methodology. Because you can do most of this in one way or another with PyPy or CPAN commands or I forget the Rust ones. Complete blank. Okay. Um, it's more about making sure you have follow a bunch of steps that are clear and succinct and you keep them and you teach your people who are doing this to do those commands, otherwise you will uh, run into problems. This is not foolproof, it, nothing's foolproof, especially when you have graduate research assistants and especially when you have postdocs. Um, any physics postdocs in here? Good. <laughs> they were the worst people to deal with. That whole XKCD about where they say, well, you know, I don't know why you have a paper, a whole uh, journal dedicated to your chemistry. It's simple physics. Uh, computer science, you know, you think computer scientists are arrogant. Um, physics people who think they're computer science are much worse. And I say this as an astrophysics major, so. Um, Anyway, work it into your system that you download to a, to a, you set up a, you know, it's like moving stuff to a classified center. Just consider it the same. The methods that were used for moving stuff to a classified from unclassified are pretty much what you need to do anyway for any large project, especially ones you need to keep around. Um, download the source have some way to check that the source has been, you know, meets whatever standards you set. It could just be, you know, it's from this guy and you saw the last commit was from this guy. It could be that they do their own signatures and GPG sign their, their, their builds, you know. Just check it. Um, there's more and more of these attacks where people are just going and s stealing somebody's SSH key, pushing something to GitHub, or to um, some other solution. GitHub actually has two factors. So if you are pushing stuff to GitHub, make sure you have two-factor turned on and you use it. Um, 
because otherwise you will end up someday, you know, you thought that SSH key, private key, wasn't copied over to that uh, shared computer, but, and you forgot to put a password on it. <laughs> I uh, had to uh, clear a whole bunch of computers once because I screwed up. Uh, build the packages in a way that you know how you build them. You know, if you know options, you know, if you're going to use certain options, keep them, you know, one of the things I like about spec files is you can say, I want to use O2 and I can set my build structure and my, all my builds are going to have O2 and not O3, O6 because, well, who does need 32-bit pi? It's not really useful. I mean, 3.1519 will get you around the world. Except in a great GR environment. Uh, and then, no matter what you're using, if it's containers, if it's, use, if it's tarballs, if it's um, virtual images for virtual machines, save that data as an artifact and set up a GPG keychain where you, and I'll, I only use GPG because it's the one I we mostly use, but if you have your own or, or ORNL system or whatever site you're at has a system with a shared, you know, cryptographic thing, use it to sign the thing and to fingerprint it. Because one of the other things is that people will come and one of the other things is to go into break into systems, take old images, and then use their research and then publish their papers somewhere else in some other country using your data and you can't prove that you, they did it. It's just, they did it. Um, or they'll alter your uh, images after they've done that so that your data is now screwed up and theirs isn't. Uh, that was a problem we had 20 years ago, and it still seems to happen every now and then. So if you're a sysadmin dealing with researchers, it's a good idea to have that in place somewhere. If not for this break-in, but the break-in after that, or the break-in after that, and the break-in on GitHub you couldn't control. And the one thing that I really want to Again, this was meant for research assistants. Uh, document for the next student. I spent the next five years after my graduate research assistant answering questions on all the things I did for different students every summer because I had not I adequately documented why I'd chosen certain options. And I found out that some of my code was still being run up until the system was put out put down in 2004. Um, it's still floating around the world waiting for us, the atmosphere to slow it down enough, but, um, and the code that I wrote, which was in Fortran 77, is still being used on a different project, so it, I'm still, and now we're getting into the other type of spaghetti western because it's lunchtime. Um, Again, as I said, this was for research assistants. <laughs> um, things move quickly. Projects do not. Research projects take decades to get done these days. They took get decades before. Your, the software that your assisted means, the software that your scientists are deploying, they may think they're done with it, and then 10 years later find out their paper's being questioned or they're up for some award and they need to duplicate the results or somebody's asked for the data so they can duplicate it. Once a research project, as, a, as my professor once told me, once a research project starts, it never ends. Um, you will be dealing with something from it till you are the next, your 
replacement will deal with it, and his replacement will deal with it until the PhD's first postdoc is dead, um, or maybe the last postdoc, because they'll have somebody working on it, and they'll want to pick it up and keep using it. Um, the things that RPMs do can be very helpful for keeping this. Uh, even in a container environment, you want to be able to rebuild a container or confirm the container is still functional. The RPMs inside there, you can use the data to confirm that nothing is altered inside of it. Or if the container actually has a similar type of thing where it's saying, this one had this, this file had this MD5, this age. SHA-256, this one had this SHA-256, et cetera. Go down the list and confirm that it was, and then confirm against some sort of GPG sign or some open SSL, SSL shared key that this is what your department wanted. Man, I, ran, I, read, I wrote this, and I, my original one took 80 minutes, and I'm now down with 35. I, Okay, um, questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned Bronzel and some other tools for, we call them like RPM build tools. Yes. What sorts of facilities do those provide over like just using RPM to build RPM? So uh, Rhymesel and Mockchain and some of the others, what they will do is they, they understand the artifact of your release. So like for Apple, we have a release of packages. It will know, I know I built this, and I know you. I'm building this. Now Koji does this a lot more. It keeps track of each thing and doesn't allow you to rebuild something with the same numbers unless you touch with the database. So it'll actually act as a different type of integrity me mechanism that you can track all your builds and go and say, I, this person built this system, this person built this one, this one built, but it failed, this one built and succeeded tracks all that, and then if something shows up and you go, well, that wasn't built by us, even though it says it was, which happens, you can say, okay, I can prove that it wasn't built by us and didn't have the, doesn't have the keys for that. Rhymesel is more built for, okay, I have 256 packages, I need to build them, and I need them all to know each other. So it builds, builds a uh, build root, sticks it in there, builds a repository, builds the next one, adds that to the repository. If those two re are required by the third package, they can then be used. And it just does that all the way through until it does it. It's, it's a bit more smarter than mark, mock, mock chain. Mock chain will do the same thing and then repeat, but it won't do it smartly. Rhymes will, you can give it a bit more. I want this one, this one, this one, this one. Um, MBS, which is the new thing, also has a whole YAML language which you can set up and say, I want these built with these options to so I want to bootstrap this. If I want to bootstrap Golang for my environment, I want these options and I don't want that other crap. Or vice versa. Uh, does that answer it? I didn't want to, like I said, I had a whole talk. One of the, some of these slides could be a whole talks in themselves. I wasn't sure who, what the audience wanted. So at this point, I guess for the next 10 minutes, yes, sir. 